Thanks for joining me today, Rusty. Um, sure. I'd like you to tell our viewers just who is Rusty Harden. <laughs> well, he's a guy that probably thought he wanted to be a lawyer one time, but waited till I was 31 before I went to law school. So I became a lawyer at uh, about 34. Started out uh, as a prosecutor. Thought I would do it for two or three years because I thought uh, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to get the experience. I loved it. Stayed over 15 years and then went into private practice about 20 years ago. So why do clients hire you? You know, when a person has a problem, a legal problem, whether it's a criminal problem or a civil problem, it's the biggest issue in their life at that time. And they want somebody that will believe in them. And they want somebody then that will fight for them. And so apparently they think we do that. So how do you help them manage the incredible amount of stress that they must be experiencing when they have a lawsuit? Well, you know, the lawyer's job is to take that stress away as much as they can. And so you try to point out to them once you decide to represent them and once they decide they want you to do it and once you figure out the fee arrangements, all those things to get them used to the fact that it's your job to worry about it, it's your job to deal with the issues. They should now back up, go on with their life as it is, and let us try to take care of it for them. Now, I know you don't win them all. No. Nobody does. Any lawyer that ever tells you he or she wins them all, you grab your wallet and get the hell out of their office. Okay? <laughs> we all lose. So what do you learn when you don't have a successful outcome in a case? Do you, do you, do you drill down? Uh, what, how do you, what process do you go through? Well, the first thing I do is worry about it and second guess. You know, it's real interesting. I, I say that politically, uh, the lesson people always, I wish I could have learned from someone like Ronald Reagan, who forget the politics, whether one agrees with the politics or not. But as a personality, the guy never had self-doubt. And he, once he made a decision, he moved on. George W. Bush was that way. And so whether you agreed or disagreed with their decisions is not the issue. The point is I've always been envious of people who don't second-guess themselves. I second-guess myself all the time. I look at a juror, my God, why did I leave them on? Or I think, why did I cut that one? Or, or how are they responding? Or what's happening? Uh, I've always admired those people who can do what I cannot do, and that is just move forward and take care of it. So when you get a bad result, then you just second guess the hell out of yourself. Did you have any mentors along your road through your legal career? I never had a mentor as such. Uh, I have, I've had people I admired um, that, that I hope to. When I taught school, I, there was about a seven year break I mentioned to you. And one of those, when I first got out of college, I taught school. And one of the students I taught was the son of a judge named, federal judge named Frank Johnson in Montgomery, Alabama. And Frank Johnson probably had more to do with the civil rights movement and the civil rights decisions, settlement of Montgomery, desegregation in Alabama, and so on. He was a man of incredible integrity uh, at a time it was very hard to be so. So I always remembered, you know, what he was like. I enjoyed Judge Sarah Johnson tremendously when I was in law school in, in Dallas at SMU, and I interned for her as a, as a law student. And she was delightful and had great stories about being a woman uh, in the early 20s in Dallas, trying to find a job as a woman lawyer. Couldn't get anybody to even give her an office. She walked up and down the streets and finally found a guy who gave her a secretarial desk outside in a reception area that a lawyer, the secretary just left. And then perhaps more than anybody is, is a lawyer named Bob Fisk in New York with Davis Polk, who personifies uh, integrity as a lawyer. And I worked with him when he was the independent counsel in 94, uh, in the Whitewater investigation, and he hired me to be the lead trial lawyer while they put, while they investigated. And uh, his whole career has been integrity. And so those kind of things. But there wasn't someone that was over my shoulder. It was more people I admired from afar. Share with me your best legal moment. <laughs> and it could even be an embarrassing one. Uh, well, there are a lot of embarrassing ones. Uh, <laughs> final argument in uh, in a case when I was a prosecutor, and uh, uh, the jury was predominantly women, and I was given the final argument, and, and I noticed there's this very serious time in a murder case, we're supposed to be talking about life in prison or so, this woman juror kept nodding her head down like that, and I thought, you know, it was getting distracting, but what, am, you know, what's going on? And then another woman started nodding her head down like that, and it wasn't appropriate for what the heck I was talking about. So all of a sudden, then it dawned on me, I'd gone to the restroom right before we started final argument. And so I had to slide my hand down, 
and I realized my flight had been unzipped all during this final argument right out there in front of God and country. And so I slipped back behind the podium, zipped up my fly, and I just couldn't resist. That's what I mean about juries. As long as you're yourself, they'll forgive anything. Without even thinking, I go, why didn't you tell me? And these two ladies go, we tried. <laughs> and so, you know, and then we had to get them back to the right mood. And, you know, but little things like that. There are a lot of embarrassing moments that happen to trial. I've had jurors point something out to me when I couldn't find it um, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you're looking, you have a photograph, and you're trying to find what it is. And one of the jurors speaks it. Rusty, it's down the left-hand corner. Well, then it tells you two things. They're, they're engaged, and they think of you as rusty, and, and that's important. So, I, I don't, you know, Anna Nicole was, a, was a, a big deal because the public made it a big deal, and the media did. And I was, I was surprised how much attention that garnered. But my favorite quote of hers wasn't, I mean, the screw you, Rusty, she's, you know, it was like if you take a new acting lessons and Ms. Marshall, because she was crying and looking to the jury and, and I asked her if she'd taken new acting lessons, and she says, screw you, Rusty. That was the comment that, that made a lot of attention, but the part I enjoyed the most was, the evidence was he was he sending her sometimes, uh, J. Howard Marshall was, $100,000 cash in the mail. And I go, how do you spend $100,000 a week? And she looks at me like I'm on another planet and goes, Rusty, it's very expensive being me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I, that was the part, that was the line I loved the most. I tried to tell her when she got off the stand after four days, Anna, why do you dislike me so much? I've been good for your career. <laughs> but she didn't believe it. So, Rusty, tell me why you love the law so much. You know, I was uh, an American history major in college, and when I taught high school, I taught history. So I've always enjoyed and, and loved history. And so many of the major moments in this country's history, uh, things were accomplished by lawyers. You know, we're at a time where everybody's very cynical about lawyers. Uh, it's not just lawyer jokes. The legal professions brought a lot of it on themselves. And where, where lawyers got a little too greedy, uh, let money become too big an issue, and so on. Um, but at the heart of things, if you look around at every social problem we have had historically, lawyers were there trying to help. And, the, and what I found is, is, is that whatever ability I have that is based on being an average person. I tell people there are a lot of people a lot brighter than me. There are a lot of lawyers a lot brighter than me. There are a lot of trial lawyers that are better lawyers than I am. The one advantage I've brought to what I do is is I'm an average person. And so I think I hear things the way average people hear. Now, do I enjoy the fact now that I make a lot more money than I did when I was a prosecutor? Yeah, but it was never enough to make me leave. I was 49 when I quit public service. If money had been a big issue, I'd have done it a lot sooner. Do I enjoy some of the trappings of people knowing who I am now so, or being able to have floor seats at a Rockets game? Of course I do. But that was never what drove me and still isn't. What What's so fun is the is the fear of failure is what has driven me. It wasn't, it wasn't the seeking victory. That's, that's great. But it was the fear of letting that person down that I was helping. When I was a prosecutor, it was the victim and society and the community. And I didn't want things to turn out wrong because of something I did or didn't do. But what I found was, as a prosecutor, for instance, when victims are sitting across your desk and something horrible has happened to them, Many times, you're the only person that can try to help them get feel like that the loss wasn't for nothing. When you move over into civil practice, it doesn't matter whether it's a corporation or individual. One of the great scenes in the Arthur Anderson, and as you probably know, Arthur Anderson was ultimately vindicated, as far as I'm concerned, when the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the case nine to nothing. But when Arthur Anderson, there was one time when a lot of their employees were outside the federal courthouse and they had T-shirts saying, I am Arthur Anderson. And what they were trying to remind people was Arthur Anderson, just because it was a corporate defendant, uh, doesn't mean they weren't living, breathing human beings there that were incredibly affected adversely about what was happening to their organization. And so what I love about practice is, is always putting a human face on it. There is a human being that is helped to harm about what's going to happen here. There's a human being that was helped to harm about what has happened. And they have a right to be heard. 
And, you, you know, the practice of law requires you to mix it with the need to make a living uh, and, and so on. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to look in a mirror and see, like, you know, I kind of made a difference. So what I decided when I was went into private practice is I would try to represent people or companies that I liked. I didn't know whether that would work economically or not. I mean, <laughs> you generally have to take enough to make a living and everything. But what I wanted to do, because I'd been in, I enjoyed being a prosecutor so much, is I wanted to get up in the morning feeling good about who I was going to try to help. That doesn't mean sometimes when they were charged with a crime, they didn't do it. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. It didn't mean that they hadn't maybe done something negligent when they were accused of it. So maybe they were, maybe they weren't. It didn't mean that the accident wasn't partly their fault or whatever. What it meant was they were a human being that I felt good at the end of the day going home saying, you know, I did something worthwhile today. I used to have a, a, a very good friend in the DA's office, he's still a good friend, but neither of us there now, who used to say, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, prosecutor today, I'm a lawyer today, but I'll have to shave every day the rest of my life. And I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know, I did it the right way. <laughs>